I'm feeling well. But uh, happy to be here with you guys. And we have, I think, a really exciting message this morning uh, from the book of Acts. And I'm really excited to get into that this morning. But uh, let's open in a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for this morning and what already happened and just the, the way that music ministers to us and the, the ability to come before you and just worship you freely and with joy in our hearts. And we just thank you for what you've done in our lives. We ask you to continue to work and show us new areas that you want to take us, that you would just begin to open up our eyes to the world around us that you have placed us in. Help us to be the ambassadors you've called us to, to speak truth and hope and life into the lives of those that come in contact with our lives every day. We thank you for your word as we open it this morning. Help us to, to learn from it, Lord, that it would speak to us and quicken our hearts. In your name, amen. Amen. Well, the last few weeks, we've had some really great messages. We've talked about, um, we got swimming upstream up there. That was Ted's sermons, but uh, we, we could still be swimming upstream. We kind of are still swimming upstream. Uh, as far as you are the one, I mean, that was what, uh, that's what he talked about a lot. It's just, you are the one, you know, swimming upstream in a downstream world. And, you know, a couple weeks prior to that, I spoke about fingerprints and how we were made in God's image. And we have a role to play. We have this mantle that we carry everywhere we go. And the people that have influenced us are a part of that. But we have the ability to influence others and be shapers of what's happening in and around us. And so those are key things. But... Um, this morning we're going to sort of stay, I guess, maybe in that same vein, but jump a little bit further. And I just wanted to ask because the reality, this is me, and, and different seasons there's more on the list than, than, well there's always more than should be, but there's, you know, it's kind of an ebb and flow thing. But are there people that you think of, whether you know them or just, you know, they're president of countries, you know, that you never get to know, but you'll, you, you know of them. Are there people that you have in your life that you see out in the world and you wonder, does God have a plan for that person? Is, is, is that person too far gone? Is that person irredeemable? Is that person, God could never do something with that person or that country or that group. Um, you know, they're unfixable. They're not worth the effort. I've tried, you throw your hands up. I just, I'm not even sure what to do with this person or this group or these, these type of, well, group, country, people, whatever it is. We have all these different things, this coworker, this boss, or people in your life that you've written off as being unreachable. And I'm ashamed to say that, you know, I, and I would guess that it's probably the same for all of you. You get kind of fed up in life, and there's probably people that you've just gone, I don't even, I don't even know what the point is with this person anymore. You know, I can't reach this person. I can't. God, what are you going to do in this person's life? Do you really have a plan for this person's life? And I'm, so I'm not saying that that's the right stance, but I think that is something that we've all engaged with. We've ever put somebody into a category as being too far gone. The sad reality is a lot of times we put ourselves in this category. We're too far gone. God couldn't redeem this. God, you don't know what I've done. Well, you, maybe you do know what I've done, but I, surely because you know what I've done, you can't do anything with that. We write ourselves off. We have these conversations, right, these internal dialogues that are happening in our voices, in our heads. And so we, we come at this, and we, we write people off, or we write ourselves off, or we say, I can't do that. I don't have this. I, there's no way God could use me here. There's no way I could speak and do this. And we, we begin to limit ourselves and limit the people around us, the people, groups, neighbors, churches, denominations, countries, whatever it would be, right? So we're going to jump into the book of Acts this morning, and I'm going to start in Acts chapter 8. And we will have the slides on the screen, and we can jump around. Um, you guys can watch up there and get it that way. Use your phones, tablets, your paper. I like paper. Paper's good. I like ink on paper. You can be able to write notes and stuff. Of course, I know you can do that digitally as well, but there's just something special about paper. So however you are consuming the word this morning, Grab that, get ready, Acts chapter 8, we're going to start in the first three verses. Now this is right after Stephen, the first martyr of the church, has been murdered by Saul and his associates. So Stephen has just perished and starting in verse 1, and Saul approved of his execution. He's happy about it. And there arose that day, so right at that point, his execution sparks massive persecution into the church. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the disciples, or the apostles, pardon me. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Committed them to prison. 
There's a couple cool things, even in just these three verses, that I want to start with before we continue on. In this short little passage, we can see that God cares for the suffering. God cares for those that are being hurt, those that are being oppressed. And, and we see this, because, and really, that's God's heart throughout Scripture. You know, this shouldn't be a surprise to us. We've read, if you've read through the Bible and you're started at the beginning and you're all the way to Acts, you've read a lot of stories about how God cares about the suffering. He cares about those that are being persecuted. His heart has always been for the suffering. That's why he continually makes his way, makes a way for his wayward people to come back to him. They still go into exile. They still go into Egypt. They still have these things, but God always makes a way and provides for them to come back into relationship with him. He's moved to compassion for those that are lost and hurt and alone. There's a lot of lost and hurt and alone people in our world today. You might yourself be sitting there be one of those lost, hurt, and alone people today. But Jesus came that we would have hope. He came to seek and save the lost. Matthew 18, 12 says, what do you, this is Jesus talking, what do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes, has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go search for the one that went astray? Or in Luke, in the story of Zacchaeus, we all sang it, maybe if you grew up in church, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. We all know the little kid's song, but Zacchaeus 19, 9 and 10, Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. And he's saying, this man here, this man that all of you hate, this man that is evil, this man that has done you wrong, this man that has just been so crooked and corrupt in so many ways, this man is also a son of Abraham. This man is under the promises. To say son of Abraham, he's saying the promises, the covenant promises, this man is, is also has right to those promises. This is a man that is under Abraham's family. He has seen salvation come to his house. Verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's the mission. The mission is seek, save, lost. Or Luke 19, further on, starting in verse 41, and when he drew near to the city, he wept over it. This is Jesus. He wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that would make for peace. He's just torn. He's saying, I've come, I'm standing right here, the God you've been waiting for, I'm in your midst. If you had only just seen the peace that I'm bringing. But now they're hidden from your eyes for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. They didn't miss it. They didn't realize God was in their midst. He knew the hurt and suffering that was going to be coming their way because of their disobedience, because of their rejection of who he was. And it tore him up. He cares about the suffering. He weeps over the city that missed his coming, his visitation. He was brought to tears. So here in Acts 8, we see a major pivot in the world stage. And what we see happening as we, it really is a, a, a pretty big hinge point in the New Testament itself as far as coming through the Gospels to this point and now all of a sudden we're shifting to the church age and the church being reached or created in a lot of ways throughout the rest of the books, all the letters we read from, from um, Paul to the different cities. So here in Acts 8, we see a major pivot change and, but going back to these first three verses, it talks about the people here, they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, okay? Samaria, think Samaritans, good Samaritan, right? Samaritans were lower than dirt. It's kind of Zacchaeus. They're not people you want to hang out with. They're not people worth your time. And really, technically, the way that they were viewed by the Jewish people, they were half Jewish, but even though they were half Jewish, they were considered to just not be Jewish people at all and worse than Gentiles and not under the promises of God and not have any claim or rights to the promises of God. So Jewish people regard them just as nothing. This is not the people you go send the message to. This is the people you, you know, let's go around their territory. And what does it say? They were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. So you have these people that are being just dispersed because of this persecution. And as we just saw, God's heart has always been for the, with the afflicted. Israel was enslaved in Egypt, in Assyria, in Babylon. They were, they were put into exile. They faced all these different things. Always God made a way. Samaria was a part of the nation of Israel before the kingdom split into the two nations. 
He heard their cries. Exodus 3, 7. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. <clears throat> after he redeems them in Egypt, after he comes out to the mountain, what does he do? He gives them the law. He gives them these, the, the Ted will sometimes call them the don't hurt yourselves, right? The 10 don't hurt yourselves. He instructs them and he says, you know, protect the people on the fringes of society. Go to the widows, the orphans. Look for the foreigners. Look for the people that are the outcasts. Look for the people that don't fit the mold, the people that people want to throw away. Go find these people. Reach out, instruct them to protect them. But what's amazing to take note of is that so many of the deepest sufferings that people we read in the Old Testament, and true for today too, a lot of them are because of someone else's actions. We're seeing this play out on TV. I know a lot of us are very consumed with just what's happening in the world today. And the actions of one nation against another makes the news every day. And we see the disaster that's happening with these people in Ukraine because of what's happening and what's being put on them from Russia. So absolutely that can happen in our own lives where the actions of others impact us. But often the deepest pains that we feel, the stuff that if I were to, you know, sit down and have a conversation and, and people were willing to be openly honest and discuss the deepest pains that are in our lives, a lot of them are self-inflicted. A lot of the things we want to keep buried and hidden, the pains and the struggles and the hurts and the sufferings and the things that we've gone through, so often are the things that are self-inflicted. We see that in scripture and we see it today. Israel chased after idols. They chased after the things they thought would fill the hole, they thought would, would make them feel complete, that would bring joy for a season, that would, would fix their problems, whatever it would be. They chase after these things, and really it is idolatry. And a lot of these things were made of gold and stone and silver, and we don't sit that way today. We don't have maybe little stone altars like they would have back then in our homes, but it's very easy in our own culture to chase the idols of our culture, to chase after the things that stone, gold, silver, maybe not in a literal sense. Many of our greatest pains are inflicted by our own idolatry. And the working man definition of idolatry is seeking fulfillment through means other than God. Are we seeking fulfillment through the means other than God's means in relation to our marriage, in relation to our work in relation to what we think we need to, to live, our materialism, in relation to how we view sexual issues. There's a lot of things that God's saying, hey, that's not what I designed for you. And we chase after these things and we, we bring suffering. Where are we seeking fulfillment? Are they in line with God's means? And so I want to give you guys some hope today. This was actually paragraph, two sentences out of um, some notes, a notes section underneath in my, in my Bible here. But just hope for that scenario today. Christ was the obedient servant who suffered without any sin. He didn't sin, but he suffered our, our pain. He suffered the consequences of sin, even though he was righteous and perfect. Christ was the obedient servant who suffered without any sin. He walked in obedience to the Father, but still suffered greatly allowing himself to identify both with the Father in his perfection and with us in our weakness and our pain. This is what allows Jesus to be the unique mediator between God and humanity, and that is the hope of the gospel. The fact that he is able to be that mediator between us and God because he understands our pain and our sufferings, and yet he was the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice that was needed for the atonement that was needed for our salvation. And like Zacchaeus, Jesus can say, salvation has come to this house today. So let's go back to Acts chapter 8 here. So we already read 1 through 3. Um, we'll read it again. We'll go into the next section. Saul approved of his ex execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. We sang this morning, and I didn't plan that, <clears throat> but we were singing it, and I was, just, I was thinking of this scenario. We sang, you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turned it for good. 
This is that moment. And we've seen that play out in Scripture a ton. The things, the sufferings, the things that come at us, so often God takes those and he flips them. And what the enemy meant for evil, for destruction, the enemy was trying to destroy the church before it got off the ground. The enemy was trying to, through Saul's hands, go house to house, pulling these people, throwing them in prison, saying, no, this is not going to happen. And what happens? They're scattered to the regions of Judea and Samaria. What the enemy meant for evil, God turns it for good. And what's interesting here, these three words, except the apostles. Did anybody catch that? Did anybody that strike you? Because I kind of think a lot of times in just growing up in church and everything, I think of the apostles are the ones that are going. The apostles are the ones that are heading off and they're going to the towns and they're setting up the churches and they're preaching and they're spreading the gospel. But what happens here? They were scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. So God took the horrors of Saul and all of his associates and persecuted and and, and sent people into the world to spread the gospel, starting with Samaria, starting with the people that were not the people you want to go talk to. And typically, we, like I say, think of the apostles spreading the gospel. So let's go into verse 4 here. Now, those who were scattered, not the apostles, those that were scattered, went about preaching the word. And then we jump right into a story with Philip. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Everyone is forced to scatter this persecution, but what was intended for evil, what was intended to crush this movement, actually just was like fuel for the fire and just spread this movement. We read through the rest of the book of Acts. I read through the book of Acts this week, just looking specifically for where is it that maybe not the apostles are involved. And it is a ton. And, and if we read, I'm just going to read just a list here of just other people. Some of them are named. Some of them don't have names. Some of them are just generic men, the women, the church in X city, whatever city that they happen to be talking about, the Ethiopian, Lydia, the prison warden. We never got his name. He was just the prison warden. The centurion, devout Greeks, leading women, the Bereans, the Greek women of high standing, the brothers, are, that's referenced several times, the brothers sent Paul. Well, who are the brothers? Nobody knows their names, but it was this church that was already established. People, believers that were in these cities, men, women, some had names, Dionysus, Demarius, Aquila, and Priscilla. They were tent makers. These were just people that were just going about their job. They were doing their work, but these people were influential in leading people and connecting to people. Crispus, um, it just goes on and on and on. Over and over and again, we see people that are leading the way. People are the ones that are spreading the church. People are the ones sharing the gospel. People are the ones that represent Christ in these cities. It's not Paul. It's not the other apostles. They come into town, and they'll spend some time, and they invest in the people, and they pour into the disciples that are already there. But they came into town to minister, and then they move on. The gospel spread house to house, person to person. That's exciting to me, just reading that again and seeing how this isn't about come to a location, come to a place, and we got the thing here and the event and, and the cool thing, and then, okay, well, you guys all got your little church fix, and then we just kind of go about our lives. No, church was happening house to house, person to person, unnamed people, heroes of the faith. We don't even know their name, living out their faith in these cities, and it started with persecution. It started with the suffering that scattered them to the winds. People of all ethnicities and backgrounds, powerful people, wealthy people, poor people, hurt people, sick people, different nationalities, men, women. I mean, you name it. You go through the book of Acts. Everybody is represented. Everybody is represented. And a little secret I think we've forgotten in our modern church experience is the absolute truth. One, yes, the apostles were necessary and they were a catalyst to spark that movement. But the fuel that kept that fire going was the people. The fuel was the people living out their lives in their workplaces, living, going and being a tent maker, being involved in these cities that were just pagan, evil, wicked cities. In fact, who is it that the Bible says was turning the world upside down? In Acts 17, 4 through 7, and some of them were persuaded to join Paul and Silas and did a great many, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring him out to the crowd. 
And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. So they're intentionally looking for, and their reference about turning the world upside down is to Paul and Silas, but all of these brothers are active participants in turning the world upside down. It's not just the 12. I've, I've said it. I, don't, I know I've said it from here. I've said it to people. We talk about 12 guys tur- up, you know, turn the world upside down. These 12 men turn the world upside down. Yes, in part, but it wasn't just those 12 guys. We have to reframe our thinking and realize that it's all of these house churches, all of these people that were scattered to the winds were turning the world upside down. Over and again, we, as we read through these towns and places in Acts, and, and go through the story of Acts, these, there was already established churches when Paul shows up. When he shows up, it's not like they've never heard the story. He just goes and finds the believers that are already there living out their faith, doing their thing. And he goes, hey, nice to meet you. And he gets introduced and he begins to invest and pour into it. the church that had already existed there. He didn't, they didn't, weren't sitting around waiting for him to show up. They'd had life change. They'd had God do something inside of them. They'd seen what Jesus did. And it changed their life. And it set the course of their life going forward in their city, in their context, in their world. And here's what I love. They didn't explain it away. They didn't say, well, man, I just wish Paul would show up. We just need Paul to get here. And then we can start doing stuff. They didn't explain it away. Say, man, if I could just get that seminary degree. If I could just, I need to learn a little bit more, memorize a little bit more. I need to, if I could just get these ducks in a row, then maybe I could do something for God. No, they just stepped right into it. Did you guys know that basically they looked at what they had in their hand and they started with that. That's where they started. They started with, what do I have in my hand? What do I already know? I've seen what God did in my life. I'm going to share that and tell other people. Do you you realize what God just did in my life? This is real, man. Let me tell you, my life has totally changed. You start there. You don't have to have the degree. But did you guys realize right now in Asia, and I'm not talking American missionaries that we're sending over there, but on the ground, Asian, in the, you know, bulk of Asia, not just China, but bulk of Asia, the average education of pastors and missionaries throughout Asia is eighth grade at best. So that excuse of like, ah, oh, I just wish I had more knowledge of the Bible. I wish I had more degree. I wish I, these people are turning Asia upside down and they have less than an eighth grade education. We need to get past the roadblocks that we're throwing in our way, our self-imposed roadblocks. Acts 18, let's go a little further into Acts here. Acts 18, verses 24 through 28, I love this. The next two stories I'm gonna read to you I think are just so cool. So, verse 24, now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures, He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. All good things, right? And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. Okay? So, so far, we're tracking. That's good. But he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, okay? Priscilla and Aquila, tent makers. These aren't church, you know, pastors or whatever. They're just, they're business people. But when they heard him, they took him aside and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. So Apollos took what he already had. He didn't say, I got to figure it all out and then I can start talking. He said, I already got this truth. Let me start sharing this truth. And then others come alongside and they encourage and they exhort and they build up. So Aquila and Priscilla Priscilla come alongside him and they explain the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross the, to uh, Achaia, I guess how you say that. The brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. So again, in this town, they wrote to disciples that were already there. There's already a founded church there. They didn't write to Paul. They didn't write to some other apostle. They're writing to churches that are already functioning and thriving and reaching people apart from any apostle being in their midst. So they write to the disciples there to welcome him. Hey, he's coming. This guy's legit. Get him plugged in. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. And I love that because two things. Apollos just, he, 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 had, he took what he had and he said, I'm going to start there. I'm going to start explaining and talking to people about Jesus. And the other side of it, Priscilla and Aquila, not shying back, oh, I don't want to hurt his feelings. I mean, he's, he's doing pretty good. He had most of it. But 
lovingly, they came alongside him and said, hey, let's grow in this together. That's the power of the church. That's the power of people surrounding each other, encouraging one another, exhorting one another, learning from one another as we grow in this journey of faith that all of us are on. So let's go ahead and jump to Acts 19, 1 through 5. And it happened that while Apollos, the guy we just read about, was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Again, he, there's already disciples there. He showed up and he's looking around. Oh, there's already a church here. Sweet. He starts introducing himself. These are people that have been part of that scattering. The message that Peter gave, the, the preached, right? Right after the Acts 2 in conjunction with the church being scattered in Acts 8. The world is beginning to hear this message, but not just because of the 12, because everybody that just live in their lives, men, women, young, old, different ethnicities, they're all sharing Christ and sharing what God's done inside them. So he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. But they were still pointing people to Jesus, living out their faith. Because that was where they were at, and they continued to grow. It's a great model. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Their faith just grew. Their faith just progressed. They got more information. But it's not about information, but they grew in their faith, right? Paul was able to pour into them and say, hey, let me take you from where you're at to where, you know, let's go a little further, where God wants you to be. What's happening in these passages and throughout really so much of the book of Acts is really our mission statement. Believers are meeting people where they are. They're interacting with people where they're at with the stuff that they already have, and they're starting there, right? Ephesus' disciples are doing what they know. And what, you know what's interesting, too? Both those passages reference John the Baptist's ministry. And John the Baptist lost his head pretty early on, right, in the Gospels. Herod murdered him. And yet, these people in deeper parts of the world are practicing and know about John's baptism of repentance. The ripple effect, we have no idea what the ripple effect of our lives will be. We don't understand, I don't think full. I think we kind of do, we think we do. But I don't think we really understand the ripple effect of the things that we pour into people and how that carries on through history and how that affects generations to come. How much more so should it be with the gospel, the message of truth, that the ripples don't stop with our generation, that we continue to see the faith move further and further and further. So in Ephesus, they're doing what they already know and, and again, shows the reach of John's ministry. But... What is the mission statement of, of the churches here? The church, City Hope Church. We want to lead people from where they're at to where God wants them to be. Because we're about Jesus' people in the pursuit of both. So we take what we already have and we say, hey, I'm on this journey. And hey, I work with you. You're my neighbor. You're in my family. Whoever it would be, right? We connect with them and we just say, let me tell you what God's doing in my life. We don't have to sit down and walk them through the Romans road and get our little flannel graph out and get our pointer and go, now step A, and we need to. Nobody's looking for a, a flow chart, right? People just want to know, why, why do you have so much hope? Why do you have so much peace? Because the world's falling apart. I mean, two weeks ago, none of us were even talking about World War, you know, nuclear war. Last week, we're talking about nuclear war. The world can change that fast, right? And we've seen that play out. But there's a lot of people that are hopeless and scared and they're hurt. And some of it, like I mentioned at the beginning, it's self-inflicted. And so they've, they've begun to tell themselves the lie that they're not good enough. They're irredeemable. They can't be fixed. And that's just a lie. That's the enemy trying to squash and crush what's going on in that person or that group. And we know that God wants to take the things that the enemy meant for evil and turn them for good. Amen? And here's, here's the back end of that. We're, we're not promised results. And that, that's kind of hard because we want results. And really, as Americans, I think we're kind of result-driven people. We, we monitor the results. We're number crunchers. We, 
We want to see like, you know, what was our sales figures compared to last year. Results matter. And so even though we maybe say we don't want, re we aren't about results, we kind of are. We like results. We like to see the chart and know that we did better and we earned more, we did more, we whatever than last year, right? But we're never promised results. We're only charged with faithfulness to our calling. Faithfulness to the calling and the message of the gospel. That's it. We're called to be faithful ministers of the gospel wherever we go. We're not promised the results. And, and, I, and Acts, again, Luke, in, in giving us the book of Acts, I think he just lays out so many great things. Um, going a little further, let's go into chapter 24. gives us a great example of this. So in Acts chapter 24, verses 22, and we'll skip 23 and go to 24 um, through 27. It says, but Felix... This is like a Roman, this is like a governor person, like a leader, right? Uh, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off. I mean, like, I don't want to talk to Paul and, and these guys. So accurate knowledge of the way. What he's saying there is accurate, accurate knowledge of what the, um, the church was growing, the Christian movement. They weren't calling themselves Christians at this point, but the way was basically the, the people that were following Christ. And so he had an accurate knowledge of the way, Christians, and, but he put them off. He didn't want to talk to Paul. So jumping into verse 24, after some days, though, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. So she was kind of interested. She wanted to see this Jewish person, and she'd heard about, again, they were familiar with the way. So Drusilla and Felix show up, and he sent for Paul to hear and heard him speak about faith in Jesus Christ. And as he reasoned, not talking about Paul, and as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away from the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. He's like, enough. He, he was making him uncomfortable. You need to go away. Verse 26, at the same time, he hoped, so he kind of had selfish alternative motives here, but at the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, so this guy knew about the way. This guy was curious and said, I want to have a conversation. My wife and I want to, you know, tell us about this Jesus. They repeatedly had conversations with Felix or with Paul, Felix and Drusilla, had repeated conversations over the course of two years. But Felix was succeeded by uh, Porcius Festus and desiring to do Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So by all, by all rights of what we understand, Felix never had life change. He never put his faith in Jesus Christ. Two years Paul invested in this guy. We are never promised results but we are promised to faithfully represent Jesus Christ, to point people toward Jesus Christ. And Paul, every time they got together, he, and we read it there, and it made him uncomfortable, he reasoned with righteousness, self-control, coming judgment, talked about Jesus Christ. They wanted him to speak about Jesus Christ. He had a platform. He used it, but we aren't promised results. We aren't promised results. We're getting close to wrapping up here. Um, if we, let's go back to Acts chapter 8, though where we started this morning. And starting in verse 4, again, now those who were scattered were, went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits un crying out with a loud voice came out of many who have them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were were healed. But this last verse, so there was much joy in that city. I love that. There was much joy in that city because of Philip. Because Philip went to the unreachables, the unfixables. And he said, let me tell you about my Jesus. There was much joy in the city. Is there much joy in our city? Is there great joy in our city because of City Hope Church? Is there great joy at your workplace, in your sphere of influence, in your city, because you are there? Because you are there representing Jesus Christ, pointing people to the hope that you yourself have found. Would somebody on your epitaph write that? There was great, I, man, I am just blessed when fill in your name, Bob, John, whatever your name is, fill in your name in the blank, is around. Would people say there's much joy in the city because of, like there was with Philip? 
more than ever, people are looking for hope. They just are. I know you guys are probably having the same types of conversations with people, the interactions. Some are short, some are long. I got my hair cut this week, and the conversation I had, it was, it was good. I was not a church person, but it was a good conversation. I was able to talk about the church. People are, and they, they, a lot of people are willing to ask fair questions and ask and, and pursue and just an understanding. It doesn't mean that you're going to change their hearts right then and there. But we have to be faithful to the call. We have to be willing to, to step into, take what we have in our hand, take what we already know, and not be put aside or afraid that, oh, well, what if I say it wrong? What if I don't, and I don't know that much about, and that's not what God's asking. He's saying, I just, I've already given you what you need for this moment. We talked about the last several weeks with the fingerprint series and some in, in the uh, Swimming Upstream series. God knew you were going to be here today in 2022. He knew you were going to be alive in this moment. And he uniquely positioned you purposefully for that moment to speak truth and hope and peace in life to the people that you have relationship with. Because all of you have relationship with people I don't have relationship with and vice versa. We all have relationship with each other, but outside of this body, outside of this house, we all have different groupings of people that we have opportunities to rub shoulders with every day. People we work with, live next to, that are family members, the places we like to shop and eat, the drive throughs we go through. We all have opportunities to spread the hope of Christ. Peter tells us we need to be ready in season and out of season in, in 1 Peter. We don't need to have our seminary degrees to be ready. The church we read about in Acts proves this to us. And I hope that I've done that this morning and just walking through this. It was really exciting for me to see again and again and again just reference to no-name people, people that I feel like, especially after reading different passages, like th those people deserve to be given a name. Like we need to know what that, that Sally, she did something pretty amazing for God. And it was just the leading women, the brothers, the Greeks, the men and the women, and they did this. And it, it seems almost passing. And the reason is not because it's flippant or because that they didn't have value. It's because it was just automatic. It was just like, well, of course, you know, the men, of the, the disciples of the church, of course they were going to live out and do the things that God had called them to. It was just automatic. And I want to live my life more and more in that mindset of just, it needs to be automatic. And so I was challenged this week in reading the book of Acts. And I want to close with just one, um, one last verse from the book of Acts, talking about Paul, Acts 17, 17. And he's, Paul's in another city, and he's talking with people. But what did he do? He reasoned, it says, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. And I put that in bold on my paper here. In the marketplace every day with those that happen to be there. Whoever just happened to be there, well, there you go. That's my calling today. I think we, we overcomplicate it. Sometimes it's just, are we able to be Christ to people, point people toward hope, show people the love that Christ has already shown us, Show patience and kindness and the fruits of the Spirit, all of them, self-control, gentleness. Are those evident in our lives? Are they things that people would naturally see and be drawn to? Are we bringing joy to the stores we shop in, the places we work, the spheres of influence that God's given us? It's a powerful challenge. And so... We're going to close in prayer, and, and, and I, I hope you've been challenged this morning to, to begin to maybe reframe your thinking of what's possible. One, to silence the lies that maybe you're hearing in your head that you're not, I can't, I don't have, and begin to realize that, no, you can, you are, and you have what I've needed to give you. You have what, you're need, what is needed to do what I've asked you to do. Because so often we throw our own roadblocks in and we stop ourselves. And we get hung up with results like, oh, well, if it doesn't happen, then I'm a failure. No, God just calls us to be faithful because there's going to be some Felixes out there. I've had them. I, I know of several Felixes in my life that I invested a lot of time with. And I don't say that meaning like, man, what a waste of time. 
No, I just, I vested a lot of time with, and they just, they didn't make that choice. I can't make that choice for them. But I'm still called to present the gospel and love people and give of my time and my efforts so that it hopes that they would come to know Christ. Everybody's on a different journey, and that is our mission here is to lead people from wherever they're at to where God wants them to be. And we have to understand that we're in different places on that journey, but the people that we come in contact with are in different places on that journey as well. And so we just need to boldly step into that moment. And just as we read in these stories in the book of Acts, begin to lead people throughout our city and bring joy to our city with the gospel and the hope of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And I just thank you for the book of Acts again as I read it this week and just the encouragement that I, that I got from it. Lord, as we see you move throughout this church and we see you move through the first century and bringing the gospel to the world and how ordinary men and women of all different backgrounds and all different economic status and all different nationalities were able to spread the gospel, to love people around them, to show the faithfulness that they had toward you. And it changed the world. God, I pray that that would be us as we go into Boise, Idaho and the Treasure Valley. That every day, just as we read in that last verse in, in Acts 17, just as Paul every day would go to the marketplace and whoever is in our sphere, whoever's around us, Lord, that's our mission field. Give us wisdom, give us strength to step out and to love people, to pour hope and life into people that are just desperate right now. So many desperate and hurting people. God, I just pray for the, the interactions that are to come with this body and the people that they interact with this week. I pray that you would begin even now to soften hearts, that you would even now begin to embolden the people here to share their faith, to speak truth, to just reach out and just be kind to somebody. Lord, I pray that we would begin to see major life change in the people that, that you have surrounded us with, the people that you are bringing in droves to our city. Lord, we all know that our city is exploding with growth right now, and it can be a frustration, but God, I pray right now that, that we would begin to see that as, no, you're bringing the nations to us as an opportunity to share our faith, to point others to the hope that we have in you. And Lord Jesus, I pray as we go from here that you would keep us safe, that you would guard our hearts and our minds, that we'd be prepared to speak that truth to the people that you bring our way. I thank you for this church. Be with Pastor Ted and his family as they're, they're getting better. And Lord, I pray that we come back next week with new stories, new testimonies, new opportunities to share the, what faith and, and the growth of people in, in the lives around us, what we've seen you do in our world. God, you are so good. You're so good. We thank you, Jesus, for all these things. We pray it in the only name that matters and the only name that can do any of this, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you need prayer this morning, our prayer teams, they'll come up and they'll be here. Um, if you need to go, we understand. But, but if the prayer teams could come up here, if you just want to just spend some time Maybe just seeking where God's going to take you this week would be great to come up. If you, you're dealing with just some struggles, you know, we all have, like, like I started this morning, Jesus meets us in our struggle, meets us in our hurts and our pains. Maybe there's some things you're struggling and there's some hurts you're dealing with. These people would love to pray with you. God is available. You don't have to do anything magic to get his attention. He is always available for you. And so we're going to close. Have a great week. And, uh, I look forward to great things and, and some really cool stories, testimonies coming out of your interactions with your spheres this week. Amen. Have a great week.